brothers and sisters here at the Apollo and brothers and sisters nationally. This is a historic place and we have assembled we have assembled I would say one of the greatest assemblies of black leadership Latino leadership to be found anywhere in the country. We are proud tonight to welcome such distinguished people. People who have given their lives to service and to struggle for black and brown and all oppressed people. So I think we are privileged tonight and we would be remiss if we did not recognize some of them so that you would know around the country and here at the world's famous Apollo Theater on 125th Street in Harlem who's here tonight. First we would like to thank our national co-chairs who helped to spearhead this effort and facilitated the wishes of Dr. Shabazz and the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. They are Brother Leonard Farrakhan Muhammad, the Chief of Staff of the Nation of Islam, and Brother Haki Matabuti. Let's give them both our national co-chairs a hand. We thank them. And locally, along with myself, we had the great Reverend Butts, who helped to co-chair the New York group. But we want to thank everyone that was involved. And we thank those that have come out this evening. I want to begin by recognizing someone that you probably wouldn't necessarily expect to be here tonight because this is a movement issue. But what I found is that movement folk really appreciate music. And it seems that musicians really appreciate movement folk. So we have in the house with us tonight a distinguished giant in the music industry. He is none other than the great Lionel Hampton. Let's give Hamp a hand. To my left, we have the mother of the struggle. We have a woman that has been struggling before most of us were even thought of. She is none other than Queen Mother Moore, the mother of the struggle, Queen Mother Moore. We have to my left, the national spokesman of the Nation of Islam, Minister Abdul Ali Muhammad, and the National Minister of Health. We have directly behind him these nationally known brothers in the rap hip hop nation, none other than Dr. Dre and Ed Lover. Let's give them a round of applause. We have Dr. Lenora Falani with us tonight, a great sister in the struggle, the Reverend Dr. James Bevel, a longtime civil rights leader. Give Reverend Bevel a hand. We have Sheikh Akbar Hassan Sharif, the first man to ever teach the Honorable, Elijah, Honorable Louis Farrakhan of Islam. Let's give this great giant in the history of Islam a hand. Moving down to my right, we have a gentleman with us tonight who is not necessarily black or brown or yellow. He's not a quote unquote minority, but he has defended the rights of blacks, brown, red, yellow, Muslim, Christian, Jew. He is on the side of the oppressed. He is on the side of right. He defended Sister Kabila Shabazz. He's here with us tonight, Attorney William Kunstler. Let's give him a hand. From Chicago, Illinois, a great thinker, scholar, Brother Conrad Worrell, another key player in tonight's program. We have with us tonight, in the front row, a great singer. You've heard of him. You know him. 
He makes you want to put on your red dress and your high heel shoes. Brother Johnny Gill, give him a hand. We have the beautiful daughters and family members of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. Let's give them a hand. All of his family that is here from Chicago. We have the great scholar warrior, the one that is shaking up City College here in New York and teaching black history, black knowledge all over the country, Dr. Leonard Jeffries. We have a very powerful sister who for years has enriched our consciousness. You can hear her almost every week on radio station WLIB here in New York, Sister Camille Yarborough. Give her a hand. Oh, look who I discovered. Seated behind Sister Camille Yarborough is another powerful sister. We don't believe that the black woman should be barefoot and in pregnant and uh, doing nothing. We believe that they are women and warriors, sisters and soldiers. Is that right or wrong? Well, who represents that description more than the incomparable Sonia Sanchez? To my left, powerful young leader coming up on the scene. He is a black police officer, yes, a black cop. But he does not believe in beating up black people. In fact, he believes in getting behind the blue wall of silence and stopping all officers from degrading their creed to protect and serve. He is a guardian of the black community, Eric Adams of the Guardian Association here in New York City. There's so many. There's so many and we obviously cannot get every one. We have the National Attorneys of the Nation of Islam, Brother Minister Abdul Arif Muhammad and Sister Minister Ava Muhammad, give them a hand. They are fighting a tremendous battle against the wicked New York Post. We have with us a long-term freedom struggler. Those of you in Cleveland and other parts of the Midwest that are listening know him as well as all people around the country. Our brother, Brother Ron Daniels, give Ron Daniels a hand. We have the chairman of Inner City Broadcasting in the house, and we must give a special recognition to him, not only for his long service to the Shabazz family, but his long service to the black community, locally here in New York and nationally. He also represented Kubila. He is none other than Mr. Percy Sutton. He is with us tonight. Where is Mr. Sutton? He's upstairs. And I know in some cities, you may not have progressive politicians. You might have foot shuffling, knee bending politicians. But here in New York, particularly in Harlem, we have some heavyweights. And the dean of the politicians in New York City is none other than our brother, Congressman Charlie Rangel. He is with us tonight as well, a strong black politician. Do you know this gentleman? Do you know this gentleman to my right? Who himself believed in black unity? Who himself didn't believe that the NAACP should continue to be divided from the black nationalist groups? He sacrificed his position, but truth crushed to the earth will rise and his greater objective and greater cause, black unity will make him forever remembered amongst our people, Dr. Benjamin Chavis. This tall gentleman on the front row, we had to put him on the front row because his legs are so long. 
You hear him all over the country, the Night Talk family, because he promotes the concept of respect. He greets you, I respect you. Well, we respect him too. And he's here tonight, Bob Law from Night Talk. And of course, you know that tonight is dedicated to unity. And there are two very special people that are with us that you hear from tonight. But since she is present, and she's present with another very special woman, I think that we should honor and recognize Dr. Betty Shabazz and the wife of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, Sister Khadija Farrakhan. Let us stand for these first ladies of the black nation. Look at them. Look at them. Look at how beautiful they are. Let us hear it for them. Dr. Betty Shabazz and Sister Khadija Farrakhan. Oh, what a blessing this is. Only God could have brought this about. There are so many. All praise is due to Allah. There are so many. And we don't have time to recognize everyone. Everyone is special. Everyone is important. I see Tess Marcellus, who sang beautifully in the reception down on the front row. I see Terry Williams of the Terry Williams Agency. So many decent, wonderful people in our community. Also present tonight is Mr. Mike Wallace of 60 Minutes. He wanted to be here to witness this history. We thank him for coming. And this is the Apollo Theater, so. <laughs> See, we have a lot of feedback here in New York, you know. But I don't want to take any more time. There's so many people, and I hate, oh, yes, how could I forget? How could I not recognize the conscious managers? See, we don't need sports figures, Negroes who don't know anything to do but pummel their brother. Is that right or wrong? We need someone like Muhammad Ali who said, I'm not going to fight the Viet Cong because the Viet Cong never called me no nigger. Well, when I hear Rock Newman, I think of Muhammad Ali, I think of Don King, I think of conscious sports figures who recognize that they are black first and a part of an oppressed people. Give Rock Newman a hand, the manager of Riddick Bow. Oh, yeah. We have Crazy Sam in the house. We have the great rapper Freedom Williams. You know Freedom, that used to be with uh, CNC Music Factory, but now he's on his own, doing his own thing. He's got some strong black rap coming out, and we thank him, and we're happy. We see Sister Walia, the wife of Sister Stephanie Mills, who would have been here if she could have been. Look at this gentleman to my right. You know him, you've heard of him. Mr. Gary Bird, Imhotep Gary Bird. You know him. Minister Don Muhammad is here, the East Coast Regional Minister of the Nation of Islam, a hard-working 30-year veteran in the struggle for black liberation. I see the Chief of Staff is coming up on my shoulder. Let me get some brief instruction. Oh, okay, we want to move the program. So, brothers and sisters, I thank you for applauding our brothers and sisters. And if we forgot someone, please forgive us. We didn't mean to. Everyone here is special tonight. We thank you for being here with us. And now, without any further delay, I want to bring on a brother who is really one that maybe you around the country don't know. But he's one that we know here in New York. And he is representative of a group of three black lawyers that have sacrificed not only their time, their effort, and their money, but ultimately they have sacrificed their legal careers fighting for black people. Here in New York, we have powerful attorneys, Alton Maddox, C. Vernon Mason and Colin Moore, and they all have been unjustly robbed of their right to defend black people. We can't forget them. We must fight for them. If they fight for us, we must fight for them. The Honorable Louis Farrakhan said, how can we have a call for justice when the people who fight for our justice are being illegally taken out of the courtroom? These brothers are dynamite in the courtroom, and that's what they fear. Let us hear from Colin Moore representing the legal team and a legal analysis to take us further into our program. Thank you as I greet you in peace. Assalamu alaikum. Wow. 
Assalamu alaikum. Fine. Good night, brothers and sisters. It is great to be in the house of the Lord. Wherever the people of God is, there is the house of God. Amen. So, um, as Brother Conrad said, and Brother Conrad was really on a roll, <laughs> as Brother Conrad correctly says, um, right in New York here, in the so-called capital of justice, we have witnessed numerous acts uh, of injustice. Uh, as he mentioned, myself, Alton Maddox, and C. Vernon Mason have been um, deprived of our license. But we believe that there is a God, and we believe that there is justice. And as Brother Conrad so correctly says, truth pressed to the earth will one day rise again. And we believe that the people are with us, and the people united will never be defeated. It is my great honor this evening to introduce to you two of the attorneys who have uh, represented Ms. Kabila Shabazz. Uh, the first attorney who is sitting here um, has been already mentioned. He exemplifies the term activist attorney. He's been around long since, ah, well, since before I was born. It's been around a long time, and he has done great work. He represented an array of defendants. As a matter of fact, his client list is like the who's who of the nationalist movement in this country. He has represented the Freedom Riders in the 1960s. He was a special counsel for Martin Luther King. He was a counsel for Adam Clayton Powell. He was a counselor for the American Indian Movement, for CORE, for SNCC, and for the Black Panthers. He has represented the Chicago Seven, and now he is representing, among other people, myself, Seaburn and Mason, and Alton Maddox in our field. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the attorney of last resort. The attorney to whom other attorneys go to when they are in trouble. <laughs> Our brother, William Kunstler. You do it. <laughs> well, get away from the microphone. <laughs> you want to do, do Percy too? No, we have to do Percy. Assalamu alaikum. The other attorney uh, who is represented Kabila Shabazz is no stranger to the uh, Apollo Theater. As a matter of fact, he is one of the owners of the Apollo Theater. He has had a distinguished record. He is what we call the Renaissance man. He was the borough president of Manhattan. He was a uh, candidate for mayor. He was the attorney for Malcolm X. He is the attorney for the uh, family of Malcolm X. He is the proprietor and owner of the Inner City Broadcasting Corporation. And he is one of those people who, having had a successful career in law and politics, went on to make a lot of money as an entrepreneur. But nevertheless, he has not lost his conscience. Ladies and gentlemen, the eminent and dignified co-counsel for Kabila Shabazz, Mr. Percy Sutton. He said, "My business partner may lose my, may lose my conscience." Huh? <laughs> he said, "May lose my conscience as a businessman." <laughs> no, I think that's what he implied. Go ahead, Bill. I just want to indicate that Percy and I were the two oldest lawyers in Minneapolis, <laughs> still practicing law. But he was my first client in the civil rights movement because he had the gall some 35 years ago to try to integrate the men's room in the Jackson National Airport. <laughs> he and Assemblyman Mark Lane were doing it together in the restroom. Tell him what we were doing, Bill. Um, <laughs> at separate urinals. When in came Captain Ray, 
of the Jackson Police Department, and they were accused of what they call mixing down there in those days, and they were carted off. Fortunately, we persuaded the judge to let them go. Percy pleaded on his knees that he'd never been arrested before. And he, he didn't want his family to hear about it. And no, they, were, they stood up like rocks in Mississippi, and the judge felt he couldn't leave them in Parchment Penitentiary. So off they went back to New York. 400 remained, though, in Parchment, and those were the Freedom Riders. I would just like to explain one thing, because we only have a few minutes, about this particular case. And I guess my theory of it, which may differ from others, but I think is not inaccurate, given the past history of the FBI. I thought the theory behind it was to indict Kabila on the strength of the word of the most evil man I have ever met, Michael Fitzpatrick, right. and to have her indicted for a conspiracy with him to assassinate Louis Farrakhan. The hope was that someone out there, some crazy, would do the job, and that a charismatic black leader would join the so many charismatic black leaders that have been murdered, ostracized, discredited, sent to jail, or exiled. You only have to think of Marcus Garvey, Paul Robeson, Dr. Du Bois, Malcolm, Martin, Adam. You can go through a whole list where this has been done. And the way they tried it once before, 35 years ago, was to use what they call COINTELPRO. And I have a report here where the FBI took credit for the murder of Malcolm X. Here's what the FBI report on January 22, 1969, almost four years after the death of Malcolm X. Over the years, considerable thought has been given and action taken with bureau approval relating to methods through which the nation of Islam could be discredited in the eyes of the general black populace or through which factionalism among the leadership could be created. Factional disputes have been developed, the most notable being Malcolm X Little. They were really gloating over the fact that he was destroyed on February 21st, 1965, in the Audubon Ballroom. That was what was lying behind this case. And I think that it was brought to see whether they could get Louis Farrakhan assassinated along the way. And you will notice that four or five days after the indictment came an announcement that HUD was going to investigate the money, the federal funds, going to the Nation of Islam in Chicago to guard the projects in Chicago. And Henry Cisneros, the secretary of HUD, announced this. He, as you know, is under investigation for perjury with the FBI in getting his office when he became a member of the cabinet. This was a great privilege for me to work again with Percy. This time he's a co-counsel, not a client. But almost everybody up here is an old client. I think only Queen Mother Moore has not been a client, but a friend. But everybody, every name I, I hear, James Bevel, Ben Chavis, Percy, etc., is a client of mine at some time, and I say these are the most wonderful clients any lawyer could ever have. And I am very happy and proud to be part. I guess maybe this is one of the most shining moments of my life. I just received a very important note. It says, wrap it up. I wrap it up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Bill Kunstler has given a number of names of people that he has represented over the years. And I want each of you to say thank you to me for Bill Kunstler says that he was my first, I was his client, but I want you to know that was Bill Kunstler's introduction to the civil rights movement.
want to give him a proper introduction. <laughs> I could have been a wealthy corporate lawyer if I hadn't met him. <laughs> but, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for being here. I thank you, wherever you are, witnessing this by satellite in the various cities that I understand this is being transmitted to. It is important that you gather. I will not discuss the case itself, but I will tell you that we are grateful, and I came here to say that to Minister Farrakhan. We're grateful that he reached out at a time at a time when it was most helpful. We're grateful to Congressman Rangel for intervening. We're grateful to a number of people. It was a case that should never have been brought to court. Our client was charged with conspiracy, but that was not the true conspiracy. The conspiracy was one of the government using a lying, conniving, cocaine, sniffing, No, I'm sorry, I better not say any more. I have too many friends. I have too many friends who are now recuperating. And it's important. He will not, however, as a witness, ever recuperate. So thank you very much. I represent the Shabazz family in saying to you that we're most appreciative. Someone asked, would I be here tonight? And I was introduced as owning the policy. I don't own it at all. I used to own it. I lost so much money, I turned it over to Congressman Rangel. <laughs> it is now a not-for-profit organization. In all of the 11 years I owned it, it was always not-for-profit for me. <laughs> so thank you very much for being here, won't you? Thank you. One word, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Is it? One more word. We want to express our gratitude to that lady up there, Betty Shabazz. She was the heart of our team. Love you, lady. Keep going. Actually, the note that I gave Bill Kunstler said, "Wrap it up, please." <laughs> Hi, I'm Junette Pinkney, and I'm a member of the New York group that has been part of planning this evening's program. You heard Minister Conrad Muhammad speak earlier about the politicians in New York, and of course, foremost among those is our first speaker, Congressman Charles Rangel, who represents the 16th Congressional District in Harlem, USA. Congressman Rangel has held that position for nearly a quarter of a century. We're, ple we're pleased to hear from him this evening, very briefly. <laughs> I got my note already. And it does say please. Let me say this, my brothers and sisters, make no mistake about it, that the scenario that's unfolding in Washington has us as the target. And it did in the beginning of the campaign, and this contract, if it's on anything, is anything that's not European, and you just take a look at what they're saying when it comes to welfare, Medicaid, any of those cuts. Now, you don't have to be an economist to know that they got us as, us as the target. But they're prepared to go down with these cuts themselves as long as we are pictured as being the ones that's going to be disadvantaged. People don't say it, but they are dismantling everything that has been done since Roosevelt, Kennedy, and Johnson. Tonight, 
what we have here is that two people with hearts, Minister Farrakhan and our beloved Betty Shabazz have said that there is enough that we have to come together as a people and stay together. Now, and are saying that no matter what their pain and frustration, that nobody, white or black, is going to use this pain as an excuse to hurt somebody. Yes. And so I can say for people all over, whoever started this conspiracy somewhere, yes. we are not going to end until we find out who the conspirator is. This case, because of Bill Consler, because of Percy Sutton, may be put behind us. But as we go to sleep tonight, we have no idea who may be working on our case. God bless you. It's really a, a, a personal privilege and an honor for me to introduce my sister and my and dear friend, Sonia Sanchez, whom we know as a distinguished professor, author, and poet who uses her words as potent weapons in our struggle. Her latest book, Wounded in the House of a Friend, has just been published by Beacon Press. Sonia Sanchez, for two minutes. <laughs> Hello. Bring it down just a little. You taller than in these microphones. That's all right. You need to be in. Well, I think they have a patriarchal podium up here. <laughs> but the joy of being here with Sister Betty Shabazz. With Brother Minister Farrakhan, yeah. I want to call on some of our living and dead ancestors, Ella Baker, C.L.R. James, W.B. Du Bois, Nzinga, Shea, Sojourner, Marcus Garvey, Ida Wells Barnett, Paul Robeson, Harriet Tubman, Sandino, Nelson Mandela, Fanny Lou Hamer, Geronimo, Winnie Mandela, Martin Luther King, Jose Marti, Shirley Graham Du Bois, David Walker, Margaret Walker, Alice Walker, Martin Delaney, Queen Mother Moore. <laughs> Nguma, Sterling Brown, Angela Davis, Geronimo Pratt, Stephen Biko, Herman Ferguson, Bernice Reagan, Chavez, Oliver Tambo, Chris Haney, Septima Clark, Mr. Michaud, Audrey Lord, Walter Rotney, June Jordan, Maya Angelo, Fidel, Sister LeBron, Dada and Mama Sisulu, Chinua Echebe, Tony Morrison, Hakeem Mahabuti, Baraka, and Gugiwa Thiongo. Malcolm. 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 I begin my reading with calling on the goddesses. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yo 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 Madre, mother, mama, may, mother, mama, 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 mother, 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 mother of Sister Gorilla Shabazz, daughter of, daughter of Malcolm, 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 little sister, little sister, brother, minister, Louis Farrakhan, pair, father, padre, father, 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 father. We are here to thank you coming together tonight for coming together tonight for showing unity to the world, showing the world that we are here to join hands in unity, to show our young brothers and sisters that we know how to work walk in peace and dignity. We know finally how to live. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Mm -hmm. go ahead. 
We know finally how to live off our lives instead of our deaths. So brothers, sisters, wherever you are listening to us, smell their courage. I say smell their courage and smell your courage and taste their courage, shaking our memory, making us reinvent ourselves in the year 1995, when silence is the order of the day. We are here then because, we are here then because, and our work and their work and our work and their work was neither just father or son or mother or daughter. Our work was midnight rise and morning marches. Our work was moving in and out of smoke jails, smoke filled jails and jeers. And above all, our work was courage. I say courage. Can you taste it? Can you say it? Can you breathe it? Can you walk it? I say courage. Courage, brother, brother, courage, brother, sister, sister. I say courage, courage. Of men and women moving a people to a glimpse of their greatness. We are soldiers in the army. We have got to fight. We've got to fight. We are soldiers in this army. We've got to fight. We've got to fight until we die. We are here because we are the first man woman on this earth. Can you imagine? Have you forgotten that? What does it mean to be first and now to be last? Huh? Tell me, how do we get to be last on this earth? And how, on the continent of Africa, when you see the first people called Twa, who are now known as Hutu, deal with that, are now killing each other, huh? And tell me, what genetic thing is that all about? You got people who were first on the planet Earth now killing each other. And tell me, what does that mean genetically for all of us? What does that mean for the first man, woman, peaceful on this Earth, can now murder and hack each other at will? What lesson is that for us here in the States, my brothers and sisters, in the Americas? Let no one come between us. Let no one come between us. What has, what does it mean for our young to shoot each other at will. Let no one come between us. What does it mean when we hear the sounds? Mama, 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 mama. Daddy, 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 daddy. They're killing us. They're killing me. They're hacking me. I'm, I, I'm running from the soldiers. I'm running from the soldiers. I'm running to the soldiers. Toss my, to, 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 my mama. Toss my mama. Toss my mama. And, and, and she is waiting there for me. Smiling, smiling, smiling. And, 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 and she is raising, raising a sword. And she is hacking me to death, 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 to death. What do it mean? What do it mean when we kill each other willingly at will? What it means for us now moving towards the 21st century, my brothers, my sisters. What it means finally is we have to learn how to live. We got to learn and talk about what it means to live. I mean, the question for us all as Africans in the Americas, on the continent, in um, any continent is how do we live? How do we live, blood? How do we live, blood? How do we live? Latino? How do we live, Asians? How do we live, whites? How do we live on this earth? How do we live and walk in dignity? How do we live upright and walk, huh? How you gonna do it, blood? How you gonna live? How you gonna live with that machete in your hands? How you gonna live with that Uzi in your hand? How are you gonna live? How are you gonna finally live, 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 live? I wanna live, I wanna live, I wanna live, I wanna live like Malcolm. I wanna live like Malcolm. I wanna live forever. I wanna live forever. Ever, and we live forever if we work, organize, come together, work, organize, and come together, and we will live forever. Work, 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 organize, organize, brothers and sisters, organize and work, and it will, it will get better. In three words, eBay, eBay, yeah, 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 yeah
She is a teacher at City College and she is the host of Radio Spirit on WLIB Radio. <laughs> Sister, did you have to call me up here right after Sonia Sanchez? Did you have to do that? <laughs> Listen, there's a Ghanaian proverb which tells us that the moon moves slowly, but it crosses the sky. That which is natural is inevitable. Truth, crush the earth, will rise again. That which is natural is inevitable. And so this day, and this minute that we're waiting for, mm, yeah. Go ahead with it. where we see not an organization, not even a nation, but an African woman and an African man join together on this stage, and in doing so, join our people around the world. This is a short time we have, so I'm just going to say a few lines from a, a song that I'm working on. I think it's appropriate for today. It was inspired when I went to those slave dungeons. Gore, uh -huh. with Dr. Leonard Jeffries. And the words go, there's been so much to take us apart. From today back to the tragic start that brought us here in pain and fear. But every time we were taken apart, we kept the faith and we made a new start. Loving again and again and again, determined to live, determined to be together. Because we are the people of Africa. We are the African family. Family home in the motherland, family scattered across the sea. And no matter where we have gone, no matter where we may be, we are the people of Africa. We are the African family. And it's exemplified by this sister, Dr. Betty Chavez, this honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan this evening. I'm waiting for that moment. All right. Rock Newman is, among other things, the manager of heavyweight champion Riddick Bowe. Newspapers in Washington, D.C. referred to him as the person most responsible for the re-election of Marion Barry as mayor of Washington, D.C. Rock Newman. Oh, almighty God, it is you to whom all praise and honor is due. Amen. I thank you for this privilege to be able to be a part of a piece of work and a majesty that you and only you could have delivered. For 30 years, the devil has invaded our family and our community and made them his playground. 30 years ago, the devil divided these families sitting here today. However, you, O oh Allah, are the fixer of all that is wrong. There is joy in knowing that we serve such a powerful God. There is joy in knowing that the God we serve is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. Dear God, thank you for keeping and maintaining our princess, our queen, Dr. Betty Shabazz. You see, Malcolm indeed was our shining black prince. And surely again, it was you, it was the work of you, O oh Allah, that provided Brother Malcolm with his princess. Oh, what a princess she is. Malcolm's princess and the queen of a needy people. Betty, we love you. We want you. We need you. And you need never worry again. 
through the blessing of Almighty God, we will forever take care of you and your family. Very quickly, very quickly, we did not really come here for a social affair. This is a serious evening. And to in part demonstrate our seriousness, my wife and I are not sure what the collection or the, the process of further raising money is going to be. But I did need, I did need her permission when it comes to the checkbook. So as she sits there, she has given me permission to stroke a check tonight to start this off to the tune of $10,000 for you and your family. Let me say further that I am serious when I say that we are serious. This is a momentous occasion. On June the 17th, we have a boxing promotion in Las Vegas. There are men playing kids' games. And out of that promotion, Betty, we will give you $50,000 on June the 17th. And Betty, there is a boxing match that the world is waiting for. And that particular boxing match hits Riddick Big Daddy Bo against Mike Tyson. And Betty, we think that within 12 to 15 months, that fight will take place. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. And what? We are pledging and guaranteeing Come on. that when that fight takes place, well, yeah. we're going to divide equally between the Shabazz family, the Nation of Islam, and that great institution in Washington, D.C., Union Temple Baptist Church, one million dollars. But I'm just wondering if I have bought a little time. Because, because I'm glad that we can share a little joy. But we know that it is a sad and cruel and painful fact that our leaders, bold black men who dare to liberate us, get taken away from us at an early age. Let us remember Steve Biko and remember Martin Luther King, black men, Africans. Let us remember Malcolm. They were taken at an early age. Black men of substance, they all had a very, very heavy cross to bear. Black men have been bearing the load of a heavy, cro heavy cross for a very long time. Just ask that black man from Nazareth, the one that told Lazarus to get up. friend, those of many of us who are here tonight have a dear friend who passed on. He was a reverend, a minister, an angel of God. His name was Tom Skinner. He loved this sister up here, and he loved the minister. And I see Tom sitting high and, and looking low, and you know Tom always had those big scruffy shoes on, and that wonderful big, pretty, loving smile. He knew so well that sweet black Jesus had such a heavy cross to bear. Tom Skinner lived for, and he would have died for tonight. So be, let us remember Biko and Malcolm and Martin. Jesus, black men, they loved us. They tried to liberate us. 
They knew what it was to carry a heavy cross. They were all rebuked and repudiated and taken at an early age. But thank you, Allah, that we serve a mighty God. Because 30 years ago, the devil broke up our family. For 30 years, the devil has been working, but there's good news. The good news is, is that God has been working too. The work of God that I am talking about is amongst us tonight. This work started about 60 years ago in Boston. Certain conditions led to attempts on his life before he was even born. But he was born anyhow. So we want to tell America and the enemies of truth everywhere, leave our brother and this reunited family alone. Your attempts, your attempts to kill Farrakhan and your attempts to kill this unity, we are rendering to child's play. 30 years ago, yes, the, the, the devil did divide this family and he tried to destroy us as a people until today we lie around dead like Lazarus. 2,000 years ago, Almighty God sent Jesus to wake up Lazarus. The devil's been working, but God's been working too. And almighty God, we know that when you're dead like Lazarus, it's only the work of God that can wake you up. And he has sent us a man who was born to carry the cross. He's been rebuked like Jesus. Like Jesus, he's been repudiated. Like Jesus, he's been scorned. Like Jesus, he's been nailed to the cross. Pharaoh, not Coabilla, tried to kill him again. The Senate voted 100 strong to repudiate him, but he got stronger. Weak knee, lip trembling Negroes. Some running for high office turned their backs on him. But he got stronger. None of them knew that they were interfering with the work of Almighty God. I am humbled and honored to be in the presence of Dr. Betty Shabazz and Minister Farrakhan, who are becoming a unifying force to liberate black people throughout the globe. Thank you very much. been talking about money in a very serious way, Brother Ralph Newman has. We'll now hear from Dr. Conrad Worrell, who is the chairman of the National Black United Fund, the organization which funds us. This is for Brother Malcolm and for those of us who were children of Brother Malcolm who inspired us to join the Black Liberation Movement. As-salamu alaykum. Habarigani. And Hotel. Sons and daughters of Africa, as the chairman of the National Black United Front that was founded here in Brooklyn, New York in June of 1980. And from all of our chapters, I would like to first thank Brother Percy Sutton for the historic, for the historic and unselfish role he has played in helping to make this event possible. The historic role of the Apollo, particularly now that it is in the hands of Africans, speaks to our continued quest for economic emancipation. We need to rescue 125th Street and all 125th streets throughout the African world community from economic strangulation. Thank you, Brother Sutton. I'd like to thank Dr. Betty Chappelle 
for, for rising to the occasion in the face of many obstacles over the years. Thank you, Sister Betty, for helping make this evening a new beginning in the efforts to rebuild our movement. And I have a little check for you from your sister, Charity McIntyre, and I can't match, she can't match really both. She just retired as a professor this week, but she got $500. <laughs> Thank you, Minister Farrakhan, and all the brothers and sisters in the Nation of Islam. Yeah. who are helping keeping the tradition of doing for self alive as a major concept that is quickly becoming a reality for the entire African world community. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us well. That doing for self is essential ingredients of our race to survive as our esteemed elder. Dr. John Henry Clark has also taught. Dr. Clark has said repeatedly that because we have not learned to practice the essential selfishness of survival, we should give no piece of the pie until every member of our family has a piece of the pie. <laughs> to the co-chairs of this meeting, my friend Chief Leonard Muhammad and my other longtime friend and homeboy Haki Matabuti, Thank you both for staying on the proper course and pulling all this together. And to my namesake, Minister Conrad Mohammed, your youthful spirit and dedication is shown like a beacon in this endeavor. <laughs> to you, the sons and daughters of Africa, thank you for helping to participate in this new beginning this rebirth, if you will, that is deep in the spirit of the African cycle of life. In the process of exercising the right of African self-determination and in the face of the intention of the non-African world to dispossess us from the universe, it is appropriate that we draw our revitalization and sustenance, as Dr. Jacob Carruthers says, from the deep well of culture in the cycles of reawakening in our traditions of women Masu the repetition of birth as we reestablish in the African world truth, justice, propriety, harmony, balance, reciprocity, and order. Sons and daughters of Africa, as the great educator Edward Wilmot Blyden said over a hundred years ago, we need some African power, some great center of the race where our physical, pecuniary, and intellectual strength may be collected. We need some spot where such an influence may go forth in behalf of the race as shall be felt by the nation. We are now scattered and divided. We can do nothing. So as long as we remain thus divided, we may expect imposition. And African nationality is our great need, Brother Lynn. Simply put, brothers and sisters, what we need is to return to the idea of black power. The recent opening of the Salam restaurant in Chicago by Minister Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam is a great inspiration to the idea of black collective power. I agree with Minister Farrakhan when he explained in a press conference prior to the opening of the Salam restaurant that with the climate of the country as it is, welfare reform, the attack on affirmative action, our people in America are going to have to learn. We must stop depending on others to do for us what we could, what we should, and what we must do for ourselves. A return in our thoughts and spirits and actions to the idea of black power will significantly help advance our struggle. The Black Liberation Movement in America must return our movement work to the call for black power. As Pan-Africanists and nationalists, we must take the lead in reissuing this call. It appears that far too many Africans in America have forgotten that we are fighting and struggling for the acquisition of power, 
specifically black power. So tonight we are embarked on the historical trail of the 1960s to reestablish the idea of operational unity in the quest for black power. Operational unity as described by Dr. Karinga is the unity in the community begins in the family and extends to the unity of organization. Brother Malcolm X taught that community unity first depended on everyone belonging to an organization. Then all the organizations uniting on the basis of common interest and aspiration which unfolds into a dynamic black united front, Brother David Brother. Further, Dr. Karinga points out that Brother Malcolm felt it was, felt it was irresponsible and self-destructive not to unite around common interests, instead glory in our differences. What Africans in America need to do, Malcolm taught, is to forget their superficial organizational differences and even differences of religion and unite around their common identity as Africans and their common interests, especially the interest of liberation. In my judgment, that is the meaning of this meeting tonight. This new beginning, this rebirth, this Wimmy Masu, this repetition of birth for the redemption and salvation of African people. As the Honorable Marcus Garvey always said, Africa for the Africans at home and abroad and up you mighty race, you can accomplish what you will. In these final hours, in these final hours before the 21st century, we need a new black power movement. Let me conclude. Instead of protesting against all these other people in our community, we need to start marching against them and start marching on ourselves. And one way to start marching is get ready to march on October 16, 1995. And in conclusion, in conclusion, finally, as Dr. Clark always teaches, that history is a compass that people use to find themselves on the map of human history. Its role, he says, is to tell a people where they have been, where they are, and what they have been, where they are, and what they are. Most important, Dr. Clark believed, like many of us, that the proper understanding of history will tell people where they still must go and what they still must be. As Marima Ani writes, let the circle be unbroken, forward ever, backward never. I need to correct myself. I was so excited by Rock Newman pledging that money <laughs> that I introduced Conrad Worrell as being from the Black United Fund. It is, of course, as it says in your programs, the Black United Front, which is a Pan-African nationalist organization based in Chicago, longtime activist. Many of you around the country know Bob Law as the host of Night Talk a program which airs on, in major cities across the country on the American Urban Radio Network. And uh, I hope I don't get in trouble for saying this because I don't know if it's true, but I've heard that he might just be a candidate for Congress from Brooklyn. <laughs> I think I can do this quickly. I'm really honored to be a part of this particularly significant occasion. Who would have thought that when this young sister Shabazz was arrested, accused of plotting against the life of Minister Farrakhan, who would have thought that it would be a catalyst for Solidarity. See, I come from the sanctified church. It's that black man from Nazareth that our brother was referring to. And in our tradition, I really believe that God moves in mysterious ways. I believe that 
God will allow for a dilemma so that he can be gloried when he delivers. Who would have thought that that incident would provide this historical and significant opportunity? So that now there is a show of solidarity that goes beyond unity. It is a show of solidarity. And it is a demonstration that, as Dorothy Love Coates says, some of y'all know about the gospel harmonettes, who warn the enemies of African people that when you dig one ditch, you better dig two, because the trap you set just might be for you. <laughs> this is a significant opportunity. This is a historical opportunity, and it speaks to the genius and the humanity and the insight of Minister Louis Farrakhan. And it speaks to the genius and the humanity and the insight of Dr. Betty Shabazz. And because of their initiative, we are stronger. Maya Angelou is right. No matter what they do, still you rise. As my pastor in Washington, or my former pastor when I lived in Washington, Reverend Willie Wilson of Union Temple Baptist Church, had to get that in, always says, we come now to the most important part of our service. And that's going to be handled by Minister Jamil Muhammad from Atlanta and Attorney C. Vernon Mason, known in New York and around the country. They will be asking us to really dig deep and they will not be getting a please be brief card. It is uh, amazing coming behind Bob Law. I have never heard Bob Law speak for two minutes. Uh, give him a round of applause just for doing that for all of you around the nation. Sisters and brothers, we began working on this as Brother Jamil comes up last Saturday. And uh, Sister Betty, Sister Khadija, Minister Farrakhan, the spirit has been so high. Our hearts have been so mended. There is so much love in this room and around the nation. We want to thank Almighty God we want to thank, as a matter of fact, I have never in all of when I was practicing law, I never thanked the government for a conspiracy. <laughs> but FBI, thank you for this one. Thank you for this one. Because what the people who had the legacy of J. Edgar Hoover meant for evil God and Allah turned into good. And we are here 30 years later. I told my children that they had to be here tonight, Sister Betty, Mr. Farrakhan, Sister Khadija. I said, because we had in our lifetime to march on Washington. We were not physically there, but we were there in spirit in South Africa. But here, what you have done is unconditional love. What you have given us tonight is something no person can pay for. No person in this room and around the nation watching this can say anything other than all that you have done for the black family around the world. All that you have done so that you are our example. If you can come together, yeah. Sister Betty, and we love you. If Minister Farrakhan, who we love, I owe him a tremendous debt. All the cases that I've had, call me. When all of these things happen with us, we're going to raise some money in one second. But I, well, I just want to tell you how important this is. 
because we're not here for a social event. This is history. This is a political event. People from all over the world saying, if those folks can come together, y'all better look out. Y'all better look out. So we thank you for that. Now I'm gonna call Brother Jamil up here. Let me, let me, uh, Brother. Do y'all feel as good as you look tonight? Tell the world. Tell the world. Let's go back in time on the issue of attacks. John Oliver Killing said attacks against black leadership are going to multiply as the conflict increases in intensity. Witness what happened, he said, to the three M's, brothers Medgar, Malcolm, and Martin. When did he say it? 1963. He saw it coming. Tonight, brothers and sisters, we can easily say that all roads have led us here to the world famous Apollo Theater. Our entire history as a people has led us to this moment in time. And you got to give the devil his due. The devil made us do it. It was a wickedly brilliant plan. The million strong black man march is coming. And just like when they saw the poor people's campaign coming, they said, we got to stop Dr. King. When they saw the organization of Afro-American unity coming to unify African people worldwide, they said, we got to stop Malcolm X. When they saw Jesse Jackson's presidential campaign come and saw Minister Farrakhan stand with them, they said, we've got to stop this unity now. They were concerned about that. And so they wanted to know, we got a million man march coming in Washington, D.C. A million black men is bad enough in D.C., but what they gonna do when they go home? What are a million black men who come to Washington, D.C. going to do when they go back home? So how do we stop Farrakhan? How do we stop the black nation from rising? They pulled out a time-tested strategy, proven effective across the years. Divide and conquer. They thought, we'll use Malcolm's family. We'll put them under attack again set up one of his own children with an assassination scandal on Farrakhan re-raise the story we planted on Farrakhan's involvement in Malcolm's death put Farrakhan in the position that we the government are the ones looking out for his personal security <laughs> plant some new stories on the divide occurring in the black community. Destroy Farrakhan's credibility in the process, assassinate Malcolm again, destroy his family, the nation of Islam, and any unity in the black community that may take place with the mass march. Wickedly brilliant. And yet, we are here tonight for one of the greatest moments of unification in our history. Truly God works in mysterious ways. <laughs> Malcolm's former attorney and lifelong friend of black people worldwide and to the Shabazz family, the Honorable Percy Sutton, pulled out his law degree and went back to the courtroom. When I saw by his side the great attorney, William Kunstler, who's shown his character and courage and commitment to freedom, justice, and equality time and time again, 
When I saw that the government was forced to drop the case and the Black Panther movie was released at the same time showing Co-Intel Pro with our sister Dr. Shabazz portrayed in the film protected by the Panther Party. When I looked at the calendar and saw that the court decision and the unification tonight were in the same month that Farrakhan was born. One week before Malcolm's worth, I say, give the devil his due. But God is truly great. And God works in mysterious ways. The moment of history is upon us, brothers and sisters. Malcolm said we cannot talk of uniting with others until we are first united among ourselves. We've got to change the way that we see each other. We got to change our minds and see each other with new eyes and see each other as sisters and brothers. Do we see each other as sisters and brothers tonight? If we do, Malcolm is smiling on us in this very moment. Give yourselves a big round of applause all around the world. You brought the energy and it's here tonight. We are pleased to bring in a brother from the Windy City of Chicago. He is a poet. He is a publisher. He is an author. He is most of all one of the most committed black men not only in this country, on the planet. His dedication is unswerving. His commitment without question. Brothers and sisters, may we welcome to perform the introduction for Sister Dr. Betty Shabazz. Haki Madabuti. In many ways, this has been one of the most difficult projects that I've been involved in over the last 30 years. The difficulty of helping to bring this event off was not logistical or due to the lack of support for it to happen, but one of the dealing with our many emotions that are resurfaced in me as well as others. For those of you not cognizant of my work, it is widely known that Malcolm X was a national hero to me. I have published poems, and in my book, Black Men, Obstate Single Dangerous, the dedication was to Hall W. Fuller and Malcolm X, El Hajj, Malik El Shabazz. In Black Men, I begin the essay, Malcolm X, A Diamond in the Coal, with these words. There's not a day in my life that I do not think about Malcolm X. His picture, along with those of Garvey, King, Lumumba, and Hort Fuller, rests on the wall above my desk. It often reminds me of the influence he had on me and millions of other blind people of my generation. To have become conscious in the early 60s is to have been touched by the truth of Malcolm X. That is beyond question. He was a man that gave my generation a voice. His presence, his example, he stand against the greatest human evil to confront our people, white world supremacy, and its creation, Negroes. Yeah. It's stamped on my mind forever. Even though I never met Malcolm X, or even saw him in person, his impact on me and millions of other people is deep and everlasting. When he was assassinated, I was 22 years old, living in Chicago as a poet and foot soldier in black struggle. Malcolm X, as a national representative and spokesman of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam, was an awesome figure. From the first time I saw him debating antagonistic white men and Negroes, I knew in the deepest pit of my psychic that here was a man of unusual cultural in intelligence, dedication, and seriousness. For a brief moment, I even contemplated becoming a member of the Nation of Islam. His manhoodness was the attraction of Minister Malcolm. He was a black man speaking without embarrassing grins, without scratching his head, clearly and boldly stating the black position. His voice was not inaudible mumblings trying to appease the conscience of the enemies of black folks. 
but was an uncompromising call for black self-reliance, self-definition, self-defense, self-realization, and self-love. A little history. I've known Dr. Betty Shabazz for about 20 years. We've been close for the past 11 years. And I turned 50 in 1992. She came to Chicago to help celebrate my half century. This celebration was also a fundraiser for our school, New Concert Development Center. As she made very kind remarks about me, she also made a rather significant contribution to our school. She received a standing ovation and my wife asked, with all of her other commitments, why did she do that? My answer was that she knew the school needed money and she knew that we would not ask for any from her. I've flown to New York to be with her on special occasions and she has been a frequent attendant at the National Black Holistic Retreats that I am involved in. In 1994, in my book, Claiming Earth, Race, Rage, Rape, Redemption, I published a critical and far-reaching essay on Minister Farrakhan titled, The Farrakhan Factor, The Question That Will Not Go Away. I circulated the essay prior to publication in my community and of those who responded, their urges were not to publish it. Most fearing the fallout. The essay was published and I made sure that Minister Farrakhan and his top aides received a copy of Claiming Earth. The response from Minister Farrakhan was that he, quote, appreciated it and needed the honest assessment, end quote. I went to Ghana as a guest of the Nation of Islam for the 1994 Savior's Day celebration, and we talked again. This history is important because my association with the Nation of Islam under Minister Farrakhan actually started in the beginning, 1977, but ended rather abruptly in 1988. We did not talk again until the NAACP African American Leadership Summit in the summer of 1994. Through the teachings of Malcolm X, millions of people the world over were elevated and given a new perspective on local, national, and international affairs. The assassination of Malcolm X caused a deep, deep split in the progressive black movement that is still on the road toward recovery. This meeting, this evening, is obviously not the answer, but it is the opening of the book. It is historical and significant, and it helps us get us through chapter one. That's right. This meeting is for our children. That's right. That's right. How and why has it come about? When Kubila Shabazz was indicted for the murder for hire against Minister Louis Farrakhan, the national black community collectively held his breath. We knew without doubt or hesitation that this did not sound right. And those of us who knew Quibilla, including Minister Farrakhan, the first thing that entered our minds was entrapment. Also, for those of us who have been involved in black struggle over the last 30 or so years, we immediately smelled the remnants of COINTELPRO and government involvement in the affairs of the black community with the intentions of using Quibilla Shabazz as a scapegoat to further split the community and of course to reawaken the tragedy of her father's murder 30 years ago. After the news of the indictment, I immediately called Dr. Betty Shabazz and Dr. James Turner. I could not reach Dr. Shabazz, but Dr. Turner and I talked. We both worked with the National Commission for the Commemoration of Malcolm X and we decided to try to keep on to reach, trying to reach Betty Shabazz. When I finally talked to Dr. Shabazz, she was on her way to Minneapolis. I asked her then what it was that we could do, and she said that she would get back to me. In Chicago, Leonard F. Muhammad, Chief of Staff, and Minister Farrakhan had issued a statement embracing Quibilla Shabazz and the Shabazz family. The Thursday before the formal arraignment, Leonard Muhammad the chief of staff called a meeting in Chicago to receive input and counsel from the nationalist, pan-Africanist, and Christian communities. 
This meeting went very well with the consensus of the group strongly suggesting that we fall, not fall into the, another trap of allowing outsiders to dictate our response to this very important problem. Our suggestions were to embrace the Siraz family and offer support. Around 6 a.m. the next morning, I called Minister Farragut, and we talked for about 45 minutes. He made it clear to me that he would never, never do anything to jeopardize the safety of Kubilla or any of the Shabazz family. I told him. <laughs> he talked about the impending press conference, and I told him that I would not be at the press conference, his press conference, I was going to Minneapolis to stand with and then support to Dr. Shabazz in Quibilla. He asked me to wish them well. After the court appearance that morning in St. Paul, along with Percy Sutton, Attorney Kunstler, and others, Dr. Shabazz, we traveled to Minneapolis, and I was able to spend more time with Dr. Shabazz. As we talked, I touched her hand and can feel the fear, the concern, and the uncertainty that consumed her entire being. As the legal defense team of Kunstler and Sutton negotiated the fine legal points, I could see in Dr. Shabazz's face the concern of a mother whose daughter had been caught in the grips of an uncaring government that had about as much concern for Minister Farrakhan's right. welfare right. as slave traders have for the oh. enslaved. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. She, Dr. Shabazz, asked me to convey her heartfelt thanks to Minister Farrakhan for his remarks at his press conference. Upon return to Chicago, I contacted Leonard Muhammad and requested a meeting with Minister Farrakhan. And as three of us talked, we began to talk about how we can begin to help Kubilla and Dr. Shabazz. I received a call from Dr. Shabazz, and she said, we have to meet. Not she and I, Mr. Farrakhan and Betty Shabazz have to meet. The important thing here, brothers and sisters, is this. This is not the first meeting of Dr. Shabazz and Minister Farrakhan. The meeting happened six weeks ago. Six weeks ago. Only about six or seven persons know that the meeting took place. And then the meeting and taking the meeting taking place in itself was a serious say, trial of the not only the bravery, but the constitution of Dr. Shabazz. Why? There's a problem setting at the meeting. One. Two, where we have the meeting. Three, how will we get all the parties there? Not to go into too much detail. But I'm flying out of Chicago the morning of the meeting. Mr. Farrakhan and his chief of staff and family flying out of Chicago on the morning of the meeting. And LaGuardia Airport, where we are to meet, is fogged in. I'm coming into LaGuardia. The plane is taken to Philadelphia. Dr. Shabazz is at the hotel waiting on me and another person. The three of us are to meet with the Farrakhan family and delegation. I'm in Philadelphia trying to get to New York. Dr. Shabazz is in the hotel by herself with her driver. And obviously, and if you ever try to talk to Shabazz on telephone, is forget it. She does not use the phone. You see. She does not use the telephone at all.
And so we were trying to on, wait on another person to join us at the meeting. He got fogged in in Ithaca, New York, could not get down. And so Dr. Shabazz and I went over to the airport to meet his plane. Of course, he wasn't on it. So this time, Leonard Muhammad is concerned about time, is concerned about the logistics, concerned about Mr. Farrakhan and his family because they're over in another terminal in the United uh, Lounge waiting for us. We're over in the U.S. Air Lounge waiting for another party. So we decided in our collective wisdom to move Minister Farrakhan and his family over to the U.S. Air Lounge and meet, which we did. And the meeting was profound. The meeting was spiritual. The meeting was a coming together and an understanding of the serious times that we're having. And at that meeting, Minister Farrakhan, Louis Farrakhan, Honorable Louis Farrakhan, said, we've got to help this family. We need to help this family. And he made a pledge through his representative, Leonard Muhammad. And I might say that working with Leonard Muhammad over the last six, seven weeks has been a joy. It's been a real joy. They put on the table that we will commit to raising a minimum of $250,000 for the Shabazz Family Fund. And that's how we got here tonight. That's how we got here tonight. I contacted Dr. Conrad Worrell and others in the Nationalist pan african community. We began to pull together that community, the Nation of Islam, through its good offices, began to touch its community and the national press. That's how we are here tonight. Well, we got here tonight in less than two weeks because we were trying to get the Meadowland and they said no. And so we went to our friend, uh, Mr. Person, Sutton, and said, can we use the Apollo? And that's all we had to do was ask to use the Apollo. Before I introduce Dr. Jabbar, there are just a few things that need to be said and understood. It seems to me that one generation and a decade is enough time for us, outside of the Jabbar's family, to learn from the mistakes of history, thus freeing our children to grow. Also, it is the responsibility of a mature, healthy, and intelligent people to release our children of the burden of long internal hatreds and betrayals. As we meet this evening, the Hutu and Tutsi people of Rwanda are ripping each other's hearts out. In Liberia, the center has given way to little men with guns. In Nigeria, corruption, greed, and political betrayal are burning at the edges of that most promising of nations. In the United States, our children are blowing each other away hourly on the streets of our communities and the prisons are exploding with young black men and women who never had a chance on the unforgiving corners of America. When we view these examples as manifestations of crime in our community, sometimes black people committing crimes against each other, we know that we are a community in need of healing, and transformation. It is not enough to just cry racism and white supremacy. Where are black adults willing to hold hands with an uncertain future for our children? Dr. Shabazz has repeatedly stated to me that she's doing this for her children. She quotes, and I quote her, there are some issues, circumstances, and situations that propel us beyond ordinary agendas. The entrapment of my daughter, Ms. Kubilla Shabazz, is a prime example, end quote. It is clear that we cannot walk in her shoes, but maybe we can help her tie her children's shoelaces. This fundraiser is for the Shabazz Family Fund. No one can diminish the pain or calculate in a human or economic form the loss of a husband, a lover, a companion, a friend, 
a father of one's children or co-parent. No one can measure the depth of the hurt and hardship that Dr. Shabazz and her children have had to endure as a result of the loss of Malcolm X. When Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, the King family received na national and worldwide support and spiritual well wishes from blacks and others around the world. When Malcolm X was killed, Betty Shabazz had a small extended family, but it was nothing like the support given to others who experienced similar tragedies. There sit Dr. Shabazz in an aloneness that is still with her today. Here are some facts that are often overlooked. After the death of Malcolm, one, Betty Shabazz was pre-30 with four children and two on the way. Two, she continued to receive death threats after the assassination. Three, not knowing which faction of her former community to trust, she became isolated. Four, there was a petition to keep her out of her home. Five, there came a series of part-time jobs and a re-entry into higher education. Six, the struggle with the economic battle to educate her children was ongoing. Seven, she earned her master's degree from Jersey City State College as a mother of six children. Eight, she earned her PhD from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and very few of us are aware of the weekly drive between New York and Amherst to work on a doctorate. Yes. Just think about that. Think about that. Nine, she has had a professional life that allows her to reach out to others and rise above the limited expectations of others, especially her detractors. It is obvious that Betty Shabazz has had to live multiple lives, double and triple roles, mother, worker, student, mother, worker, graduate student, protector, mother, worker. However, however, when there's a tear in the quilt, it is our tradition to repair and to restore. No matter how great the disruption in the music or how deep the betrayal in the family, it is in our tradition to recover and seek meaning in the horror and to discover new paths, liberating paths within the landscape of daily confusion. The wise of us seek meaning in all things. Life is a series of commitments. Life is also a refocusing, a reordering and reassessment. What one reads into the pages of life in one decade may be obsolete in the next decade. We all face discontinuities that take years and even decades to recover from. Some of us never recover. Daily we hear and read the horror stories of Vietnam veterans who have not been able to let go of the war. Most of us will experience the death of a loved one, most certainly a parent. Trauma is cross-cultural and unending. Grieving is universal and also, and so is courage. And if there's one word I would use to describe Dr. Shabbat, it would be of courage, one of courage. Against the greatest of odds, she has joined the rank of great women. I've known several great women in my life. Names that come immediately to mind are Gwendolyn Brooks, Queen Mother Moore, Margaret Burroughs, Ruby Deep, Margaret Walker, Mari Evans, Sonia Sanchez, Abana Joan Brown, and my wife, Sophia Madabuti. But courage, and for Betty Shabazz, this is courage. How does one proceed without a heart? It is in the genes and bloods of Africans that if earthquakes, floods, fire, and volcanoes are to bring death upon us, Spare my love, take me. There are people who think that they live for truth. We walk ignorant in the city and the city is all we know. Fruits and vegetables come from supermarkets. Lights exist by flicking a switch. Letter writing is what old people do. Children are sexually active at 12. Mosquitoes, ants, and worms are forgetting their place. Don't forget the raid. Bottled water is budgeted like bullets and mace. 
Our conversations now dance between OJ and MJ as the world turns backwards and other people's children and of course Oprah's Dias and Whitney's husband. The uniquely honest and spiritual among us are always lied to and laughed at. We don't understand them. We fear their peace. The conscious among us are the loneliest. They do not talk because we do not listen. Courage is not leaving the fight until every child is accounted for. Courage is saying no to the gossip of fools. Courage is questioning the smiles of sworn enemies. Courage is putting children first. Courage is wearing out of style clothes and shoes. Courage is building a life around ideas that challenge the good in us. Courage is demanding books in the face of the internet and the electronic superhighway. Courage is acting responsible as panic grips the souls of others. Courage is this woman. Courage is this woman daring to cross the crack in the concrete drawn by dull-witted prophets who mistrust the truth of their own God. Courage is Dr. Betty Shabbat. I thank you very much. Somewhere out there, Stella Shabazz is here. She came all the way from Savannah, Georgia. Where are you? God bless you. In the name of the God of our forefathers and foremothers, the beneficent, the merciful. It is my privilege to stand before you, and it is, or it has been, awesome. I never expected. whatever it was that I've experienced here today. <laughs> One of the things that Malcolm always said to me is, don't be bitter, remember Lot's wife. When they kill me, and they surely will, you have to use all of your energy to do what it is you have to do. And I've tried very hard to do that. Yes, you did. Yes, did. And one of the things is I did it because I had to do it. I defied my parents and married them, so I knew I couldn't go home. If I did go home, my mother would remind me every day so that I knew that I had to do what I had to do. But I was never fearful. Please understand it. Malcolm took the fear out of my heart, out of my mind, and out of my existence. Yes. <laughs> Whatever will will be, but I'm not going to waste my time being frightened about it. And you conjure up images in your own mind, and a lot of times people will try to put you into that trap, so that you constantly have to look over your shoulders, and perhaps throw a little salt. <laughs> so that I have tried to do what it was that I had to do. And another thing he said was, be bright and smart and all of that, but always try to be humble. 
if not 24 hours a day, at least a portion of the 24 hours a day. And a friend of mine was saying that, remember the world rotates every 24 hours. And she says, God have mercy on the soul that thinks they are sitting on top of the world as the world rotates every 24 hours. Because you might find yourself mashed. To Mrs. Khadijah Farrakhan, to the distinguished dais guest, to the honorable brothers and sisters, to the viewers and the various trans satellites that's transmitted, connected from the landmark theater that we call the Apollo Theater. I am delighted to have this opportunity this day, May the 6th, 19. 95, eight days from Mother's Day. <laughs> it's a wonderful Mother's Day gift. <laughs> it is one that I will remember for the rest of my life. Sitting in the Apollo Theater, that a man had a vision when he saw the Apollo Theater boarded up and <laughs> trash in front of it and people sleeping in the covers of the Apollo Theater. And whatever money his family thought he was going to leave, he put into the Apollo Theater to bring it out of bankruptcy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and after that happened, not one penny of that money, and it was a lot of it. After that happened, he had to then try to find paint and architects and the chandeliers that you see hanging back there. That was also part of his vision. But today we are sitting in the Apollo Theater. And when it was further putting distance between he and whatever little money he had, I understand that Congressman Rangel took over the honors. Give them both a hand. People with a purpose, with an agenda, with determination, can do what everyone else around this globe is doing. So that we applaud ourselves and let me say to you that it is a specific, unique, intense, and focused pleasure to have the opportunity of this experience in quest of justice to thank so many people whose bottom line agenda was equity and justice. God says it, and legislated by man. What could be more honorable than that? My Methodist mother frequently said, find the good and praise it. Sometime I wonder if we have forgotten. Because I'm sure if my mother said it, your mother must have said it to you. So that my purpose this night 
is to try to thank some of the people for reaching out to me. I would therefore like to thank the heads of organizations, civil rights leaders, sorority and fraternity members, service organizational members, some of the elected officials, members of religious organization, members of professional organizations, and the good brothers and sisters who just keep the sky from crushing all of us. I would like to thank in Brooklyn, they have some veterans. I would like to thank the veterans who kept the enemies at bay and have to come home and still fight for equity and justice. Let me just say that I had a father who fought in the war. I had a brother who was killed in action in, in Korea. I had a brother who served in Nam. And I had a husband who served in the streets of America. And that justice is and was equal. So that we have to be vigilant and we have to be focused and we have to remember the Constitution of the United States and we have to constantly review the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendment to get our directions as to who we are, supposedly a free people. And the fact that we can determine part, at least, of our lives, and we cannot leave it to someone else. And if our representatives are not taking good care of us, the constituents, we need to change them. <laughs> One of the lawyers in Minnesota, I was saying one day, I was just full of anxiety, and I said, where is the justice? And he says, you got to fight for it. And I say to you that if our lives are not the way we think they should be as human beings, as free people, and we are free, remember what Carter G. Woodson said, some of us behave in such a way, and that was the scenario about the back door that we no longer have to go to the back door, but some of us continue to go to the back door. He says, and if there is no back door, we'll make one. <laughs> we must look at ourselves and how we carry out our own lifespan and understand that we have to do more than what we have done in the past because nobody else is going to do it for you. A lot of folks are waiting for some white folks, good white folks, to come in and straighten their lives out. <laughs> you have not read the papers or watched the news. CNN is a good example. Destabilization is all over the world. It's not just striking our people, it is striking world people. So that if we want change, then we have to do it ourselves. Are you going to tell me to sit down now? Okay. 
<laughs> let me let me kind of hurry up. Satellite time is going down. Got to hurry up. I would like to thank select individuals who've reached out to me. But I'd like to thank the legal team. Good night, have mercy. Part of the defense team was Dan S. Stock. I'd like to thank him. But a real dynamo was Larry Leventhal. He jumps up like a jumping jack. He didn't walk to give Consular and Mr. Sutton notes. He would do power walking. I'd like to thank Mr. William Consular. He is a credit to the American justice system. Last but surely not least, I'd like to thank Mr. Sutton. This brilliant man who encouraged the legal team, who helped the legal team become totally focused, a man who has helped me and my family, I really should not say a man because Mr. Sutton never does anything by himself, whether he says it or not. It is always his family. And he says that his father who was his high school principal, and three of his sisters taught him, and he was the youngest, what was that, 20 children? 15, 15 children. See, I said that so that 15 would sound less. <laughs> <laughs> taught them to do so. I don't know what I would have done without the Sutton family because it has not been easily. Finally, I would like to thank Mr. Louis Farrakhan. Now you know him as Minister Farrakhan. For his original gentle words of assurance for my daughter and myself and her sisters and for his suggestion of support. As he said, we will have to help Brother Malcolm's family. I like the way he said that and I hope that he continues to see my husband as Brother Malcolm. A man born of a Grenadian mother and a southern black preacher father who was a Gaviite. A man who built every house he's ever lived in. A man who was a family man. Malcolm was six years old when his father was found under a streetcar in Detroit, Michigan. Boy, boy, boy.
Let me just say that, um, I know. Malcolm was a good man. Now, if you don't think so, obviously you've been hearing something that you should not have been hearing. Malcolm went into that movement out of prison with four mosques made up of senior citizens. And before he was expelled from that movement, there was a mosque in every major city in the United States and outside of the United States. For God's sake, don't take away his work and his legacy. He spent time away from his family that he should have been with his family. And now, don't reduce his work to nothing. Whatever discipline I have, which is not much, came from Malcolm, not my mother. Whatever strength I have came from Malcolm, not my mother. Whatever tolerance and love of my people came from Malcolm. I was reared like most folks going through public schools with not much respect for myself or black people. So that I have Malcolm to thank. How could I have six kids and go to graduate school and every other month I'm, they were gonna foreclose on the house and my kids was in school and the car note and the food and the this and the that and the other. How could I do that if that I didn't have some of his wisdom? How could I have nothing and still consider it a responsibility to help others? I can remember Mr. Sutton and his brother who called me into the office once and said, you know, why didn't you tell us they were gonna t foreclose on your house and take your house? Why didn't you tell us? Well, we have decided, he said, that we're gonna help you. And I start crying. He said, why are you crying? I said, because you all are so kind. He says, he really is a businessman. <laughs> Those tears dried up. <laughs> he said, we're not helping you out of kindness, but it is much easier to take, to help you rather than to have to take care of you. <laughs> Minister Farrakhan, may the God of our forefathers forever guide you on your journey. May your conceptual framework keeps broadening and may you take up the mantle and do God's work. May the God of our forefathers always guide us. Thank you. Brothers and sisters, Dr. Betty Chavez, please. Dr. Betty Chavez. In the interest of the time that is available on the satellite, and in light of certainly the moment that we've all been waiting for as well, connected with Dr. Betty Shabazz, we will introduce immediately for the introduction of Minister Louis Farrakhan, 
Nation of Islam Chief of Staff Leonard F. Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent and Merciful, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. I'd like to greet you again and with the greeting words of peace in the Arabic language. Assalamu alaikum. I'd like to thank so many people uh, that have worked to help make this night successful. My co chair, Brother Haki Marabuti. Uh, no applause at the end. Let's thank Rock Newman for his great expression of love financially. Brother Jamil Muhammad, the brother who raised a charity. Wasn't he terrific? Let's thank Brother Jamil Muhammad. And of course, Mr. Percy Sutton and all those that have worked to help make this evening uh, successful. What does it mean tonight? We see pain, we see hurt. But we're here together, and that is the most significant thing, because through it all, we are here. And out of all the pain that we have suffered, and whatever we've done to hurt and harm one another, we must remember that we have a Congress, we have a senator, senator, senatorial people, we have a president who are right now working for the destruction of black people all over this earth. So I heard Reverend Jackson say once, he said we have to see through our tears. That don't mean that we're not going to feel hurt and pain. But we have a future that we got to protect. Our babies deserve to live and prosper like anybody else's children. And we refuse to allow this government or any other government to relegate our children to the ashes as though they are nothing and flush them down the tube. A man was born in New York City. He was a child of destiny. He grew. He was born Louis Walcott. And he moved from New York, and finally he ended up in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm going to be brief because we got to move tonight. I would like to say to all of you on satellite, we've bought an extra hour because we're not going to miss not one minute of this celebration tonight. He became Lewis X through his development after his training and after his development as a musician. And later, he became Louis Farrakhan. Who is Louis Farrakhan? I would say that Louis Farrakhan today, without any shadow of a doubt, is the number one defender of black people here in America and all over the world. Make no mistake about that. We all have our difficulties and we all have our growth and development. We hope that our mistakes will be less than our successes. All of us. Because none of us can stand before the Creator as perfect people. And let he who is without sin cast the first stone. What does Tawana, Bradley, Tawana Brawley, Mike Tyson, Geronimo Pratt, Reverend Charles Cohen, Marion Berry, Michael Jackson, Reverend Jesse Jackson, Vanessa Williams, Judge Elsie Haston, Al Shopton, and now Kabila Shabazz have in common. All of them were defended by our champion and our leader today of the black nation in America, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, the One God, to whom praise is due, we thank Him, and we can never thank Him enough for His prophets and the scriptures which they brought. But if I lived to be a thousand, I could not thank Him enough for His intervention in our affairs in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, to whom praise is due forever, and for his raising up in our midst his messenger to us, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. I, I greet all of you, my dear brothers and sisters, distinguished platform dignitaries, and our sister, Dr. Betty Shabazz, with the greeting words of peace. And we say it in the Arabic language, Assalamu Alaikum. But it means peace be unto you. To this wonderful body of brothers and sisters who made this night possible. To Haki Madhubuti and to Leonard Farrakhan Muhammad. Of course, first to Dr. Betty Shabazz. To Mr. Sutton, Mr. Kanzler, Congressman Rangel. To the many speakers who spoke, to the leaders who are present. It is a great honor and a privilege for me and for us to be here this evening at the world-famed Apollo Theater in celebration of the victory of God's intervention in our affairs. We thank him for his guidance to us that caused us to see the snare and the trap in the evil machinations of those who attempted to ensnare and entrap the daughter of Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz. We thank Allah for his guidance to me and to us that he enabled us to avoid an emotional response to the indictment of Sister Kubila that could have exacerbated present tensions and created an atmosphere similar to that which was created 30 years ago, that additional harm might be done to the Shabazz family, to the nation of Islam, and to black people in general. I am grateful to God for this moment in time and I am forever in his debt for having guided us safely to this moment. I am grateful to Allah for this victory of our unity over the wicked machinations of those in positions of power who fear our rise and the consequence of our unity. I am grateful to the government of the United States for releasing Sister Kubila that she may go on with her life. I am grateful to Allah for the response of Dr. Betty Shabazz to our efforts on behalf of Sister Kubila. And I am grateful to each and everyone in this audience and in audiences across this nation whose hope is brightened and whose joy is heightened at the possibility of our reconciliation. There's a Chinese proverb that says that the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. The loss of the sacred life of Malcolm X is comparable to a thousand mile journey. 
and our efforts represent a first step in a long journey that we pray Allah will bless to end with total reconciliation of us as members of one family that as the Holy Quran teaches that our latter days may be better than our former days. It is said that there's a thin line between love and hate. And love and hate carry the same emotional fervor. One is positive and the other is negative. One is creative and the other is destructive. But when one loves as deeply as we have loved each other, and then the bond is broken and hate replaces love, we are forced to ask the question, what changed our direction? What forces interfered with this bond? When a man loves a woman and a woman loves a man and the love turns to hate, it is more than likely this turn becomes uh, comes because of a sense of betrayal. To betray is to deliver or expose to an enemy by treachery or disloyalty. To be unfaithful in guarding or maintaining, to be disloyal to, to disappoint the hopes or expectations to betray one's confidence, to betray a secret, to reveal unconsciously something one would preferably conceal, to deceive, to mislead, to reveal or disclose. Betrayal is when one loves and puts complete trust in an individual, religion, ideology, or program, and then that one feels that his or her confidence, trust, and loyalty was misplaced. This produces a breach, a chasm, a great divide that it does not appear that anyone is able to bridge. It is comparable to one's attempting to build a bridge from the west coast of the United States to the mainland of China. No engineer would be foolish enough to even attempt such. And certainly no one would wish to spend the money to do it even if it could be done. And therefore such a bridge would be considered improbable, unwise, and an impossible task. The probability of our being here today was unseen by any of us. The probability of a headline on the front page of the final call saying free Kubila with a picture of Dr. Betty Shabazz and myself was unthinkable just a few short months ago. The fact that we are here today under these circumstances says that no ordinary architect was involved in building this bridge. This had to be the work of a mighty God. A mighty God who desires our unity and the reconciliation of us as individuals and as a people. And so tonight I bow in complete submission and praise of Allah God for his great intervention that has given us this moment of victory. The scripture says, this is the day that the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. Although this scripture is referring to the Sabbath, which is the Lord's day, this is a day or a period or a millennium given to heal the people who have been blinded and destroyed by the touch of Satan. This is the Sabbath. And we who have been blinded by the touch 
of Satan are in the process of being healed. I believe that the entrapment of Sister Kabila was part of a much wider conspiracy. There is no way that the government of the United States would permit Michael Summers Fitzpatrick, a member of the Jewish community, to assassinate Louis Farrakhan knowing the possible repercussions that it could cause. <laughs> I, I do not believe that the government wanted or wants a Caucasian person to be openly involved in an attempt at my assassination. Their desire would be that a member of our own black family, preferably a Muslim or a nationalist, would attempt such to throw our whole house into complete chaos and confusion. That's right. The government admits that it worked night and day to bring about a separation between Brother Malcolm X and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Once this division was accomplished, the government by its own admission had agents on both sides to manipulate the zeal and the ignorance inside the ranks of the nation of Islam and among the followers of Brother Malcolm X to create the atmosphere that allowed him to be assassinated and the nation of Islam to sustain wounds from which it has never recovered. The devastating resulting from this wicked machination of the government sent many brothers and sisters from the nation of Islam back into drugs, crime, insanity, and it caused the destruction of entire families. Sister Betty Shabazz and her family has not recovered. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad's family has not recovered. My family has not recovered. The nation of Islam has not recovered, and black people have not recovered from these terrible wounds. It is sad that there are those who do not want to see Sister Shabazz and I sit down to make an honest attempt at reconciliation when we are both victims of a wider conspiracy. A conspiracy that did not start with Malcolm X or the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. A conspiracy that certainly did not start with Sister Betty or myself. This conspiracy started with the government of the United States because of its hatred of the movement that Malcolm X and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had generated and the effect that these two men were having on black America. J. Edgar Hoover was determined that no black messiah would rise to unite our people in their quest of justice and true liberation. And untold sums of taxpayers' dollars were used by the FBI to hurt the legitimate movement of our people toward liberation. Our zeal, our love and hatred, our ignorance was manipulated by powerful outside forces. And the result is that members of the Nation of Islam were involved in the assassination of Malcolm X. And the nation has taken the heat and carried the burden of the murder of Malcolm X. We cannot deny whatever our part was. That is true. But we must not let the real culprit get away hiding his hand and keep us fighting and killing one another. We didn't volunteer.
voluntarily split from each other. There was manipulation. There was stimulation of our own pettiness, of our own weaknesses by outside forces. And the government of America is that outside force. The FBI is that outside force. So Betty and I shouldn't be here alone. The government has to answer for what has happened here. We know the hurt of the prominent ones among us. But what about those other families? Families of the unnamed ones that are broken to pieces. Daughters who were virgins, destroyed. Young men and women that had hope in a movement, destroyed. Thousands of lives ruined because the government feared our unity. We carried no weapons. We threatened no laws. We broke no laws. But because we had an ideology and a philosophy that the government did not like. They didn't need laws passed by Congress to tap our phones, to follow us around, to harass us day and night today no one criticizes the Europeans who fought a 30-year war a hundred-year war and two world wars for sitting down to form a bond for the purpose of economic and political unity though rivers of blood and millions of lives were lost to accomplish that goal. No one criticizes the Germans, both German Jews and non-Jews who sit together 40 years after the Holocaust and attempt to move forward for the sake of Germany. Their efforts are called progressive. People sat on the White House lawn and they applauded Yasser Arafat and Yitzhak Rabin for their efforts at reconciliation, although bitter hatred exists between the Arab world and Israel. But the very thought of peace between them is received with great joy throughout the world. The Irish and the British who have been at war with one another for years now come together across pools of their people's blood yet their handshake has been received with gladness. In South Africa, Nelson Mandela sat down with his persecutors and the world saw by satellite a black man become president of a country that we never believed we would live to see such happen. An applause was made at an attempt to reconcile differences even though years and years of devastation had gone on in that country. Yet when the Crips and the Bloods sit down in a sincere attempt to reconcile and, and make peace, they are the object of scorn and mockery. And when it was learned that Sister Betty and I would meet and speak this evening became world news but how will you treat our simple and meager steps some of our own people are guilty of scorn and mockery I wouldn't sit down with him sister Betty they said Mr. Sutton why are you defending Kubila they said How could you do this, Farrakhan, they said. But you, who scorn our efforts, you can excuse America 
For 400 years of the worst enslavement in the annals of history, you, you who, who scorn and mock our humble beginning of a ruptured family trying to make it back together. But you are willing to fight and die just to sit with your oppressor. You are happy to be accepted by your oppressor without reparation or consideration. Yet you would mock us for sitting down to try and carve out a future for our people. The Chinese and the Japanese were enemies for centuries, but today they talk of peace. The Americans and the Vietnamese today are making plans to exchange ambassadors after a bitter, costly war. Why do people sit down and talk after hatred and bitterness and bloodshed has been between them? Because it is the hope of man and woman to solve the problems that keep us from enjoying peace, happiness, and security. Why then would any of you mock this humble beginning toward the resolution of conflict? This is why we want the files on Malcolm X to be open so that the world may see the real truth of what went down. We want the truth to be made known so that we as a people can be made free of suspicion and of doubt and let the truth condemn whomever truth would condemn. But the people must go free and we in the nation of Islam, as well as those outside of the nation of Islam, need to know all of the truth as it relates to the assassination of Brother Malcolm X. In my short meeting with Sister Betty Shabazz, she spoke for a few minutes, and in that few minutes that she spoke, I understood that there's something about this whole drama that I don't know, because I don't know her side. And if you don't know her side, and if you don't know what she went through, and if you don't know why she made the decisions that she made, how can we say we know the truth? We know our side, but we don't know her side, and we may not know all of our side, but the government knows all of the sides. So let's open the files up. Let us all see. Lying demons. They know that Farrakhan has nothing to do with the murder of Brother Malcolm X. My zeal and love for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was manipulated. In the government's releasing of Kubila and not taking this case to trial. In one sense, it is a great victory, but in another sense, this protects those in government who were involved in the conspiracy. It protects those who paid Fitzpatrick. And it protects the wider scheme of my planned assassination from coming to light. You don't think that the government was stupid enough and dumb enough to concoct such a foolish thing as that? It was a wider scheme. It never was to come to trial. It was supposed to lure me into a fight with Dr. Shabazz and her children.
if they paid $45,000 to this cheap hustler, how much money have they put in other sections of the community? This is no lightweight thing. They had a full range plan. That man knew what his job was. But there are others. But we didn't fall into the trap. Not because we are brilliant, but because God has guided us and history has taught us. None of us in public life who are engaged in the struggle of our people for justice are free from errors or mistakes. Humility is a characteristic that oftentimes is taken as weakness, but it is the greatest characteristic of a righteous human being. It is humility, not pride and arrogance that allows us the ability to see our own mistakes and errors. It is humility that allows us to seek forgiveness for our wrongs. It is humility that allows us to be willing to atone for our sins. To be humble means having a feeling of insignificance, subservience, but the Bible says one should not think more of oneself than one should. The Holy Quran teaches you can tell the righteous for they walk the earth in humbleness. This characteristic has to be present in us if wounds are to be healed. Any of us who struggle in this great cause of justice and liberation have no doubt offended others who are also involved in the same struggle. Or we have offended those on the sidelines who watch us as we struggle. The Bible teaches, for in many things we offend all, but if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. None of us are blessed to be perfect. So in some way, we have hurt others in our attempt to struggle for justice for our people. This hurt and offense created by words, deeds, misunderstandings, misinterpretations, suspicion and slander, all are part of our human condition which demands redress. But if we are humble, no matter what our position or station in life, we will recognize wrong when it is pointed out to us and seek forgiveness and make atonement. Forgiving each other is not only necessary, but it is divinely commanded as we struggle with ourselves and as we struggle to build righteous character as we move toward the liberation of our people. And if we cannot forgive each other and set aright our actions and correct the wrongs, then we will go down into the dust from whence we sprung, having left to a future generation the legacy of our arrogance, hatred, bitterness, and our unwillingness to set a better example for our children. Peter asked Jesus, Master, how often shall I forgive? And Jesus answered, Seventy times seven times. Why such a number? Seventy times seven actually represents infinity. The spirit of forgiveness is absolutely and vitally necessary to effect redemption, restoration, 
and reconciliation. We have a prayer that is recorded in the Holy Quran that reads, I have been unjust to myself and I confess my faults. So grant me protection against all my faults for none grants protection against faults but thee. Each Muslim is asked to say this prayer bearing witness of our injustice to self. And you know if we're unjust to self, we are bound to be unjust to others. And therefore we must seek protection against our faults and we must be quick in this struggle to forgive particularly those of us who are well-intentioned. The disciples asked Jesus, Master, teach us how to pray. And he gave his followers a prayer that has become the oft-repeated prayer of Christians. It is called the Lord's Prayer. And in it, Jesus teaches his followers to pray and there's a particular verse that the supplicant asks God to forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. To trespass is an unlawful act causing injury to the person property or rights of another committed with force or violence actual or implied a wrongful entry upon the lands of another an encroachment of intrusion an offense a sin or a wrong Jesus knew that even if we followed his teachings we still would not be free from the commission of sin or injury so he asked us to pray to the Father for forgiveness for our sins, but he also asked us to have the spirit of forgiveness toward those who have sinned against us. Three great acts of forgiveness I will mention. The Quran calls the narrative on the life of Joseph as the most beautiful of narratives. The story is tragic. A man being sold into bondage by his own brothers who were envious of him. But he did not respond to his brothers with bitterness and hatred. But he used a heart of mercy that's where the real beauty was his heart was so beautiful because it was a heart after God's heart and so Dave uh, Joseph's heart was used to reconcile the brothers with the father and with each other Christians always talk about Jesus's torment and in the midst of excruciating pain on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, our enemies have been doing what they do a long time. <laughs> and we have been very quick <laughs> to forgive them. But we have been made very ignorant and not full of love for self. So in our dislike of self, we have blundered and hurt one another tremendously. But we don't have the willingness to forgive a father or forgive a mother, a sister or a brother who has offended us. But Jesus forgave his tormentors. The prophet Muhammad in conquering Mecca forgave all of his enemies. If we in the closing years of the 20th century 
can humble ourselves when we are wrong. Pray and seek forgiveness and reconciliation. If we can do this, then this moment of victory that we celebrate this evening will lead to a great victory. Celebration in the 21st century, the celebration of our total liberation in the United States of America and throughout the earth. This wound in the black nation over the assassination of Malcolm X. This wound in the nation of Islam over his assassination cannot be healed except by the knowledge of truth and justice being done in accordance with truth. Although the Holy Quran holds prophets and messengers of God blameless and sinless, the Quran states that if God were to punish man for his sins, not one soul would be left alive on the earth. This is why in the nature of God, the quality of mercy is predominant. There is a dark side to the moon. But Allah keeps the bright side facing the earth because the dark side cannot ripen fruit and crops. We neither can plant or harvest by the dark side of the moon. Nothing can be nurtured by the dark side of the moon. It is only the bright side of the moon, that side that reflects the light of the sun, that is used in the nurturing pr uh, process. The moon symbolically represents the prophets of God. They are shown in the Quran and Bible as nurturers of their communities. Even though they have faults, God keeps their bright side in front of the people. David the psalmist said, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. But the enemy of God and the enemy of man is always probing the dark side of human nature to use it to help us in self-destruction and in the destruction of others. He listens to our conversations and he watches us from whence we see him not. And his aim is to say to God, look at those whom you have chosen. None of them are worthy. The Bible teaches that this wicked one accused the prophets and the righteous night and day before the throne. But it is written that this wicked one will be cast down. This year, October 16th, 1995, we propose a million man march on Washington and we call it the Day of Atonement, meaning at one, coming together as one, being at one, reconciling our differences. The Quran talks about Satan as the accursed one, one removed from God. Sin makes us remote from God and any human being who is removed from God is removed from power, from the sensitivity that is necessary to cultivate the better qualities of self. Sin has brought about this breach our lack of oneness with one another is a sign of our lack of oneness with God. And so on this day of atonement, we are asking the government of America to acknowledge her sins against the people. We're going to acknowledge ours. But America has to acknowledge her sins against the people. She has to repent and make atonement for her sins against the struggle of poor and black people for justice. 
the Nation of Islam, the Black Panther Party, the Civil Rights Movement, other organizations, black and white, with whom the government has some ideological or philosophical disagreement. Perhaps in the government's making atonement, she can help herself and her people toward making a new beginning. The government of America has to turn away from the abuse of power and authority. Turn away from that which is wicked, improper, and unrighteous. And whether the government atones or not, let us do this so that the gaping wound in us and our families and our people as a whole may be healed. In conclusion, it is written, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. As I leave you, approximately 10 years ago, Sister Betty, I had a dream about Brother Malcolm. A dream that was so real to me, I've only quoted it once in Detroit, Michigan. In this dream, Brother Malcolm came to me. There was a hint of gray in his hair, which signified that he had aged, and it was about a time when he would have been 60 years old this year, I believe, he would have been 70. And he came to me and said, Brother Lewis, what went wrong? And because I walked a ways in his shoes, I explained to him in the dream what I experienced in the nation, similar to his, and what I believe went wrong. When I finished speaking with him, he said he was going to seek the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and make some attempt at reconciliation. My heart was filled with joy because I knew that with Malcolm by my side in the struggle for our people, I would be so greatly strengthened. When I awakened from the dream, I was troubled. I wanted to know why after years I would dream a dream like this and see him so real, having aged about 20 years from the last time I had seen him. And dear Sister Betty Shabazz, in that same year, I was making a speech in Los Angeles. And before I made the speech, a mutual friend connected me in a telephone conversation with Sister Attila Shabazz Malcolm's oldest daughter, whom I felt very close to when she was a little girl. This is the first time in those 10 years that I will have mentioned this telephone call. But when I spoke to Attila, she spoke to me of tremendous pain. Pain that she felt as a daughter that on the 19th of May, so many students would invite her to come and speak, but she would have rather visited her father on his birthday. She thought about a son that she might have, or a child that she might have, that she would like to see sitting on the lap of its grandfather, and she said, that will never be now. I don't recall how long we spoke. I listened a lot. But when I finished that call with Sister Attila, as God is my witness, for nearly the next year, my prayers to Allah were constantly to heal Attila and to heal the Shabazz family and to heal us. And little did I know that 10 years later, a negative and unfortunate circumstance 
would be used by God to cause us to sit and talk with each other. It is, it is my fervent prayer and my hope that a dialogue between Betty Shabazz and myself will be encouraged to continue. And it is my fervent hope and prayer that the children of Malcolm X and Betty Shabazz, the children of Jesse Jackson, the children of Martin Luther King, the children of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and the children of Louis Farrakhan will come together and write a new chapter in our people's struggle for justice, free of the pain of their parents and the mistakes and errors of the parents. We pray Allah's forgiveness for our mistakes and errors. And I personally pray that Allah will allow the heart of Sister Shabazz and her children and us to face truth and in that spirit, if I have been wrong or wronged, I will seek forgiveness and will petition Allah and you for the same. May God bless us in this year of reconciliation to make an atonement or expiation for our sins against each other. And may we use this night and the spirit of this night to recommit ourselves to each other and the struggle. And may Allah bless us to be more patient with each other and bless us to use our tongues and our hands for the creative and regenerative life of our community. And may hatred be turned again to love. And may that bond of love that only God can produce never again be broken. I thank you. I thank Queen Mother Moore for her blessings on Sister Betty Shabazz and myself. I thank my esteemed father. I call him my father. The great Lionel Hampton, who is sitting here with us tonight. I call him my father because he inspired so much in me as a young person from this stage and from the stage of many theaters that I had the privilege of watching Lionel Hampton perform. May God bless you with longer life, Brother Lionel. And I thank Colin Moore, Alton Maddox, and Vernon Mason, our three legal giants who have been disbarred unjustly because they fight harder for us than others. The unity that is shown tonight, if we will put that unity behind these three black men, we can get them, are you, how do you call it, embarred or rebarred, reinstated? I think we ought to do that as a community, work to restore and reinstate these three giants. May God bless you. May God bless us all. Stay together. The musicians are about to 